Good evening, and welcome to the Discover Alaska Lecture Series. The series is brought to you by UAF Summer Sessions and Lifelong Learning. My name is Althea St. Martin, and I'll be your host this evening. Again this year, Summer Sessions has a full lineup of free programs, Monday through Thursday evenings at 7. Each Wednesday night over the course of the summer, Discover Alaska features a local community member speaking on a wide range of Alaskan topics. We really appreciate the time that they are donating to help us all learn more about this great state. Next week, we'll hear from Wes Potter. He's going to be talking about walking the Davison Ditch. Please note this is a change from the original lineup as Pat Ruckenmiller is not available. He's out looking for dinosaurs. This is the 16th season of Discover Alaska series, and this year the in-person programs are held here in the beautiful BP Design Theater, located at UAF's new engineering building. It is also live streamed and recorded, allowing us to take advantage of technology to reach a much broader audience. Later, you can review and also share all of the summer sessions lectures by going to the Summer Sessions website at uaf.edu backslash summer backslash events. Tonight, in addition to questions from our in-person audience, our online viewers can type questions for the presenter into the link at the bottom of their screen. We have a really interesting speaker tonight, Stan Justice. Stan has a long history with tape trails, as he is an avid mountaineer, hiker, and also backpacker. When he retired, he became more involved in advocating for trails, grooming snow, cutting brush, and that type of stuff. His presentation is about our favorite trails and what we can do to preserve them. His topic, where did our trails come from? Please help me welcome Stan Justice. Thank you, Althea, and uh, thank you for summer sessions for putting this on, and our, uh, our tech people <laughs> actually makes this all happen, so it's, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. So uh, th these are a list of resources. If you, uh, th this picture is, again, at the end of the slideshow, so you don't have to madly write all this, all this stuff down. Some of these resources, the, the top one has a zillion links in that, and so if you, if you don't forget all the rest of them, they're all in that Interior Trails Alaska link there. This Eric Troyer and Don Kiley put that thing together, and they just went up, found every link they could find in find for Interior Trails and put them in there. So that's a good place to, to go. Trail Forks, the mapping software, I don't find, I don't use it, and it doesn't seem very complete when I look at it. Uh, if you want to get Eric Troyer's newsletter, there's an email for Fairbanks Trails. You just say you want to be on his newsletter and he will keep you up to date on what's going on with trails. You know, if there's an advocacy thing you, we need to do, at, at, uh, he, put, he puts out this newsletter once a month. And then the, the uh, Google, you can just Fairbanks, the, the link was really huge, but, but if you just Google Fairbanks North Star Borough GIS, you get to their uh, uh, GIS webpage, you can go, you go to any lot and, and figure out uh, whether it's private or DNR. You kind of have to, they stopped, they took off the title so you don't really have someone's name on there. But you can usually figure out if you, if you have to learn where, where Mental Health Trust office is located and say, oh, that's Mental Health Trust land because it's got that address on it. So it's not as useful as it used to be, but it's still pretty useful. And I also like this Strava heat map that just shows you where people have been in the borough. If you wonder, looking for a trail in a certain area, zoom in there with the heat map, and you can see if people are tra traveling through there. So where trails come from, and I'm the president of the Interior Trails Preservation Coalition. It's a little group that tries to uh, protect the trails. And I'm going to start right here at home at UAF. And, and uh, this used to be a, the Trachieta, where the, the native Alaskans uh, use this area a lot. And, and so they'd use it a lookout, you know, and they'd, they'd stand just down the hill here and look out over the flats and wait for a moose to come by. And then they'd run down the hill and, they, and, they'd, and they'd get their moose, you know. And so through the years, the, uh, the, the trail has now become the way the kids get to the Marlin for a beer. So, but it's still there, you know. And so, 
So that's what the university looked like in 1949, the year I was born. Uh, right down here is that's that's pretty much the whole of campus right there. Uh, there's uh, the Farmer's Loop wasn't even there. This is a road going north that went right around campus. Belaine Lake was there, and uh, part of Yankovic Road was there, but it, it uh, cut off. And Smith Lake, but some of the trails were already here. That the ag farm had put in a trail that went out to the tea field. You can barely make out. Uh, Estill Connector was there. Uh, Beaver Slide were there. They were probably ag oriented, but uh, they were there. And there's this line that goes across up there. I have no idea what that is, but some bulldozer went across there. So there, there were a few trails. You can, and you can, you can kind of make out the baseline, that the baseline had been surveyed. It's, this, the, uh, it's what all our sections and townships arrange, all base, uh, they're all come off that baseline. And we call it baseline trail for some reason. <laughs> but the interesting thing I saw in this picture is what is this? This was all cleared. And it's, it's part of what happened when they did the, with the bicycle bumps, that they, they made this potato field, and it worked out fairly well. But then they cleared this, and the land just melted and became all the trees tipped over. It was up, and so that's why the bicycle bumps is, is all like this. And, and so this field was abandoned quickly after they realized that, oops, that didn't work out so well. And then 1972, the Nordic Ski Club, I know you can't actually see much on this map, but this was, the, most of our trails started out as ski trails. And we got nine months of winter and it's snow and summertime a lot of this is bog, so you can't really use it very well anyway. So it was the skiers that really developed a lot of the trails. So this is the main campus with a six mile trail. There was a four mile trail, a two and a half mile trail. And then going off campus, they had a, a nine mile trail and then the 12 mile trail. With, Garland 12 Mile Trail that were all in there in, in uh, 1972. And now we're working on a new map. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a work in progress. Mark uh, Oldmixon took on the task of, of, of trying to make a new map. And uh, as usual, controversies arise. And so I'm not sure how long it's going to take to finalize it. But the dashed lines means it's uh, boggy. And, uh, but, but, and, and, and so some of these lines, the Esso connector we saw were there, the T field and T field road were there. But, all, but the ski coaches were instrumental in making a lot of our trails because they'd figure out a way to get, make it happen. You know, they could, it was like they could never get full permission, but they'd kind of get partial permission. And so and then the bulldozers would come in and maybe they'd get the trail built. And so the, uh, a lot of the trails were, you know, John Estill and the other ski coaches that uh, made them happen, you know. And, and, uh, and then there's also a, that's the summer map. And then the winter map, of course, we ski across the lakes. And, and, uh, and the pooch loop out here, this was all geophysical institute for the most part, that there are these wires that run out to uh, the facility out there that was geophysical institute. And I think the army was involved with it some. And they were trying to figure out when the solar flares happen and we get these electrical currents in our wires and stuff. And so they're trying to figure that all out. So there's all these wires running across there and they were testing, looking for the effect of solar flares. Even a wire out there that's, that's cased with lead. And uh, it's like, <laughs> so they were trying all sorts of different things to try and protect these wires. And, and, and so the, and, but the main loops were uh, constructed as, as ski trails. And uh, so I, I've always figured we, the, the trail users stole the trail system from the university. <laughs> or they donated the trail system to the university, depending on your, your, your point of view. <laughs> so an example is the Himalaya Trail that, uh, that Nat Goodhue, back in the 60s, thought it was a good idea to have a trail from West Ridge to campus. You know, it made sense, and he tried and tried, and couldn't get it approved. Then Alan Doyle in the 1990s, he tried to make this trail, couldn't get it approved. Tim Stallard in 2000s tried to get approved, big, all these meetings and stuff, and they said, and they kind of finally said, okay, well, the, the, the social trails out there can stay, but the, uh, we, we won't approve a new trail. And then someone went out in 2005 and brushed in and chopped this trail across, across the hillside. And then they've had this consultant in here doing a master plan for, trans for non-motorized transportation around, you know, probably a couple hundred thousand or $400,000 contract or something to look at all this. And the contractor found that trail and, and they just loved it. They gave it a name, they call it Himalaya Trail. 
And, and they said, that's got to be your top priority. You've, you've just got to fix this trail up and make it a real nice trail. <laughs> so in the end, the university built this trail. So. <laughs> and this is your first example of a, a heat map that uh, it's, it's, it's this computer program that um, I'm not sure who all, I think it's, it's athletes, but you just see there's a lot of traffic. The brighter it is, the more traffic there is. And, and so the, uh, the, the main roads get a lot of traffic. So I think everyone, kind of everyone that has their phone turned on public mode is making a little track as they go around and Strava gathers all that data. And, and so if, it's, it's rolling two years that uh, show where people go, you know? So it, it's a great way to, to, to see what's being used out there. And uh, there it was, Himalaya Trail. And, they, and Strava actually added an end to it. So that, I think it was actually started out as Himalaya, not Himalayan. But you can see that the trail is pretty bright. It's getting quite a bit of use. Moving on to Scarland Trail. And back to this map that the uh, university campus, and we have the nine mile and 12 mile tri trail that we, we did get kicked off a portion of it here when Joe Vogler put in his subdivision. It was the one subdivision that uh, Jenny Wood did not manage to uh, keep the trail in because we, we, the, the Scarlet Trail used to go up here and through this subdivision. But uh, Joe Vogler kicked us out, so we went around and go up the uh, power line here. Uh, Pearl Creek School's here, and the, uh, the uh, trails for uh, Pearl Creek Park are here, and that's the main Scarland Trail. And the, and the trail went in before it was all subdivided. Um, and and uh, it was Jenny Wood was the kind of driving force a lot of our trails. And Fred Boyle, in the early 60s, they, they cleared the trail. And then subdivisions started happening in 66. And at Mermuscox, the, the trail didn't match its easement. So there's been a half century of brushing, bench cutting. There's been a lot of work done on the trail. The ski used to use it. And uh, volunteers set tracks on it. So. But there are these sections that this is kind of a, this bracket shows that this section and this section and that and that and that are not quite in their easement. And I was trying to fix an issue uh, right at, at Wolverine here where this is really steep. And the landowner here said, well, you know that trail's not in its easement. So I, I decided I was going to move it to its easement. So <laughs> the easement's actually on the uh, property lines. Uh, like down through here and stuff. So I, thought, I went through this whole process talking to the borough and, and uh, to, trying to make things happen. And some of the landowners said, no, no way you can do that. And so, but others were silent. You know, the, the ones over here, didn't, they didn't really say anything, but even though I sent them letters and, and, uh, and whatnot. And, uh, and so it's, we found some strange things, like this is uh, someone's sh shop, and this is the trail easement. And uh, you can see that they excavated, it's kind of a side deal, so there's a big bluff here, that they excavated away ha half of the trail easement. But fortunately, there was still enough of the easement that we could keep the trail in the, uh, in the easement there and get past there. So I got my friend, John Underwood, has got this nice little bulldog. He's, got, he's a trail builder and he's got the equipment. And, and in like half a day, he, he, you know, it's just a few hours, he, he made that trail, you know, and it was like, and then all hell broke, broke loose, you know, when, when the uh, neighbors saw what I'd done to their backyard. So. And, and it is, uh, it's pretty aggressive, you know, to come in with a bulldozer, you know, it's a very powerful machine. And, and when, when he's cutting through here, he's got to do something, he can't just leave all that debris on the side of the trail. So he spreads that debris out as far as he can over the, the surface. So when he's done, it's like, 50 feet wide of destruction, you know, it just looked horrible. <laughs> so. But then a year later, it, uh, it all kind of recovers and then uh, you, you've got a nice bench trail. So it really, uh, in the end, it comes out really nice. And now you can hardly even tell that it was ever, ever bulldozed. But I've changed my ways. Now I, now I do it by hand with a Pulaski and an ax. And, and uh, last year I did about a quarter mile of the uh, of the Scarland Trail just by hand. And we were out there uh, just yesterday uh, working on a section near Kingfisher that has these big sinkholes in it. So why, why a bench trail? On a side hill, this is what a trail looks like when you don't cut a bench. That a bench actually kind of forms, but it goes all the way down till it hits a tree. And then it loops as, as low as it can go, and then it comes back up and passes another tree. 
And uh, I, I never thought about this until someone <clears throat> pointed out to me. Now you, you'll see it all the time when you're on a trail, on a side hill, that tr the trail just always loops down next to the, next to the trees. So, because what happens is the, uh, this gets steeper on this side and all the roots show up and all the nice soft stuff is down here. So, so that, that's where it ends up everybody goes is down on the nice soft stuff, not up on the roots. And so you end up with these looping trails that barely miss the trees. So when you, when you cut a bench, you uh, outslope it three to five percent and, then, and, you, and you don't want to have a berm. So that's one thing is you're out there looking around at, if, if, if your trail's full of water, look for a place to drain it, you know, and, and let the water out. So this is what, what we want. The bench trail, three to five percent outslope and then deberm the trail so the water can, water can get off the trail because waters are hard on trails. So, Oh, the Equinox Marathon Trail. This, this issue, uh, Nat Goodhue and friends brushed the trail in 1963. And we started, we, we run it every year except for the snow year and then the COVID year. So I think the only times we, we haven't run it and we're going to run it again this year. So, but the top of Esther Dome has always been a, 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 a problem. And so this is a pretty busy map, but all the yellow stuff is owned by the Mental Health Trust. And they have one mission to make money off their land. And, and they're very focused on that. And so you ask them to, to even sell you an easement for a trail. And they think, well, could we make more from that, from that? Or we could make more from selling it to somebody. Or could we make more by mining it? Maybe there's gold under here and they don't even know. And, and so they make the decision to, to, to decide not to decide, basically. You know, we, we, we've had an application in for some trails on their land. And they, and they just kind of go silent, you know, they just don't really, they don't respond. And, and so it doesn't happen, so. But the Equinox goes up the road here, and then it goes out to the out and back, and then down the, the famous Alder Chute, and then out to Henderson Road. And uh, Alaska Ski Corporation, as part of the Homestead Act, they had a trade and manufacture site. They got 80 acres just by going out and staking it. And they skied for five years to prove up on it, and then never skied again, but they owned the land. It became private land, right? The, the entire top of Esther Dome by that Homestead Act. And, and, the, and it was like five university students that actually went out and did it. So they were clever guys that uh, got that land. And then there are two subdivisions that are pulled out of it. The two corners down there were, were sold off. But, but these two sections here, We've only been able to get day of race use, you know, the, that the owner of Alaska Ski Corporation will let us use the trail on day race. And then theoretically, you're, it was banned the rest of the year. So the Interior Trails Preservation Coalition looked for alternatives. And we found there was a section line here. So we spent years, we, there's surveyors and DNR, DNR, everybody involved. And, and, and right now, it's at the commissioner's level of DNR to decide yay or nay whether the uh, section line trail is going to be approved. But they did let us put in a uh, rough trail, just br brush out the line because it was COVID year. And so we, we got permission to do that. So last year we put in the, the, uh, the down the line here. And this trail, we've never been able to get approved, Mental Health Trust. And a lot, a lot of this is DNR land, state land, the blue stuff. And, uh, so here's what the, the uh, heat map looks. And look at that section line trail. It's heavily used, bright yellow. It, it's, it was just one year later, and it's just heavily used, you know, and it has just been, uh, people love it. So, and even the West reroute, no trail's ever been built. We kind of put some flagging up and some markers and cut, cut a little bit of brush, but hardly even cut the brush. It's a pretty open hillside, and uh, there it is. People, people are using it, so I think that's where a lot of our trails come from. Is, is if someone has the idea to have a trail somewhere, and they get it started, and then the stampede comes, and and the rest is history. So, so that's what the west reroute looks like. But you can see that it's right next to the trees. It's already, even though it's. You know, only, only maybe a thousand people have been over it or something, and already it's right down next to the trees. You know, just, so it's sure like to get the bulldozer in there and make a nice trail, but I doubt will it will happen because I, we've just learned that Mel Health Trust is 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 going to uh, let mining companies uh, explore for 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 in all those lands that were Mel Health Trust lands 
and Australian companies can be looking, mine is looking at for gold in those areas. So uh, things may change up there. But. So uh, the Alaska Dog Mushers Associating Trail is another great, great uh, trail system. They are uh, winter trails. This is all out in the swamp area. We've got College Road in the bottom, Farmer's Loop around the outside, and there, the Bushing Hall is up there. And so you can, they have these turnoffs. So if you only go up four mile, you come to here, you turn off. 4.8 mile, you turn off here. 6.2, eight, nine. It just gets bigger and bigger as, as they, as you did all these cutoffs. All the way to the 27.2 mile extension. So there's like almost 30 miles of trail out there. And the, the problem people have is they get lost out there. And you can see why. You know, you can, if, you, if, you, you know, if you go from here to over there, you're going to cross one, two, three, four, five, six, at least six different trails you're going to be crossing. You don't know which is direction is which. There's no arrows, hardly any signs. So it's really easy to, to end up out on some loop here. And you're going around and around. And it's like, I think I've been here before. <laughs> so we've, we've had, and it used to be hard because there were, there were th there's three radio towers. One there, one there, and one there. And so you get, you're thinking, OK, I know I started near a radio tower, but you get there and you're at the wrong radio tower. But the, but the, one, the tower over there has, is no longer existing. Howie Thieves pulled down the old KFR, KFAR tower. But not all those trails are protected. That the blue ones are inside Kramer's Refuge, which gives them uh, very good protection. The red ones, they've actually obtained easements for those, but the, all these green trails have no easements. They're, and there's quite a few of them left, uh, but, but uh, the year before last, we man the, managed to, uh, the, the university sold uh, all of this to, to, the, to the state. And, and the, the uh, conservation fund is the one that uh, pushed, pushed through the paperwork and made that happen. But they were using uh, Pittman Roberts monies, which are from bullets and guns and sportsman's equipment, to to uh, to, to buy land, more more land for the uh, for the refuge. You know, so we're the great deal. So glad it happened. So the, these should now be blue, but there are a lot a lot of trails still that are not safe because they are still in UA lands, and and this is such a swamp. I. I'm, I'm sure hoping that we can get this land over to the, to the refuge as well here. That's the one working on. And this is the peat mine. And eventually, we'd like to get the peat mine in, into the refuge, too, because it's, it's the one place out there that's great for ducks. You know, it's all these ponds now. It would be a great little wildlife refuge there if uh, once the once Great Northwest is done uh, mining for peat there. So what can, we, what can you do to help? Well, the, one is to learn about the different landowners and, um, and, and how to find out where trails are, are uh, donate time, donate money. Um, some things on Inform Yourself, there's the, the borough is working on a brand new trail plan. So there should be a draft coming out here soon. You can probably Google uh, borough trails plan and, and hopefully the draft will be coming out pretty soon. So researching land ownership. Get Eric's newsletter to find out where, what's the latest issues are, and just to find property corners. You know, if you you can go on that the borough's website and zoom into a corner, and get the Latin long, put the Latin Latin line in your GPS, and go out there, and and usually you're within, well they say 20 feet, but I've in my experience you're within like 10 feet, and sometimes you're within two feet. It's just right there, you know, and you've found this corner. So it's, it's uh, knowing where we're on the land, it gets really important when we're working in people's backyards. So, so donating time, the TAC is always looking for uh, people to serve on that, that committee. It's a great committee, because they're basically writing the trail plan with a, with a consultant. So uh, it's great to have them working there. And then there's all these clubs, Dory Ski Club, Running Club, Alaska Dog Mushers, Ski Joring, Fairbanks Cycle Club, uh, they all have boards. They all need people to serve as president, vice president, treasurer, secretary, and all that. So if you're in, involved with any of those activities, it's great to uh, get on there and help them keep going. 
But we can all cut brush, and you know, this, it seems like with a warming climate, we're getting more brush, you know? I mean, Golden Valley used to think every five years was often enough to clear the right-of-ways, and they're going, my God, this isn't working anymore. <laughs> this stuff is growing too fast, and it's just shooting up. So uh, it takes a lot of brushing to keep a trail open. A lot of our old mining trails were, were bulldozed and, and mineral soil, and mineral soil, uh, the, the alder just loves to grow on that mineral soil. So a lot of those, unless those trails were brushed, they are now impassable. They, you can see them from the air. They're just these lines of alders, and if you were out there, you'd walk next to the trail. You wouldn't go on the trail because it's just totally covered with brush. So digging drains, if you've got a trail that's got water in it, uh, look around and see if there isn't a place for that water to go, you know, and, and chop out a drain so that the, the water can get out of there, you know. And, and it's amazing how much you can dry up a trail uh, just with, a, with an ax or a, I'll show you some other pictures of some great tool, tr tools, but um, to digging drains. Uh, benching the side slope trails to actually carve a bench, you know, it's, uh, trails really need that. And outsloping, you know, if the trail's flat, it tends to be muddy. If it's got that 3% outslope, it tends to be dry. So just uh, working to, to get that outslope happening. And there are work parties, you know, the BLM just had those work parties to work on the, the uh, Pinnell Mountain Trail where it got torn up with the, the wheelers and all. So there's always these work parties going on. So watch for those and get out there. Money, you know, I, in my experience is that there's not really a money issue usually. It's, it's usually, uh, uh, it's usually permission. It's the hardest thing to get is to, is to actually get permission to do something. But the money is usually, a, is you can get, people will donate because people love their trails. So, but there is the Interior Trails Park Foundation. All those different clubs have uh, trail funds. UAF has two different trail funds. One's focused more on the maintenance and grooming and things, and the other is working on more capital projects if we're going to build a new trails or put in culverts or whatever. Friends of Kramer's Field, Alaska Dog Mushing Association, they actually have a fee that they would like people to, to uh, pay to use their trail. I think that was like a $40, $40 annual fee. That I, always, I always buy my trail pass to be out on their trails. And then there's a fund for Pearl Creek Park Scarland Trail. Brushing, benching, drains, root removal. It's, everyone can do that because the, the uh, chopping away, it, 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 you know, hand work works so well on trails, especially up here where it's all this lust ground there that, that once you get through the roots, it's, it's just like butter and it's easy to work with. So, so these are some of my uh, brushing tools that uh, the, I think the most important one is a uh, brushing helmet that most people don't get, but it's, it is, you know, I think it's just indispensable because it gives you that face shield that protects your face and it gives you hearing protection. So a lot of older adults don't have hearing left because they ran around with chainsaws and whacked their hearing. So, and the smallest chainsaw you can, you can get and still be functional. You don't need a big chainsaw. They're, they're just too heavy anymore. And, uh, but the, these, these modern little, uh, like a Fiskar, have these razor sharp teeth and those little hand saws anymore. It's just amazing what, compared to an old trimming, lead trimming saw, those things are just so effective. And then a good pair of loppers is also just so effective. You can, you can just, especially when it's green, you can, you can cut things, things yay big around. And my favorite brushing tool is, well, by Honda. It's four stroke, so not two stroke gas and it has its blade of death out there on the end, but they set it up so that you're fastened to it, so you, you can't get your foot, you can't get your hand out to that blade. But someone's, but my biggest worry is someone's dog coming, charging into it, you know, so I'm always ready to just bury that blade in wherever it is in, in, uh, in case some dog shows up. But uh, it's a very effective tool. You can, you can keep two people throwing brush with one person running, running this thing. And just some of the different blades you can put on, they all go on that machine. And, and this one can, can cut like uh, three inch alders, just zip, and the three inch alder is gone. So, but for most of my brushing, I use the, the, uh, that one. And then for grass and things, I, these other ones are useful. And then for moving, moving dirt and chopping roots and, and, uh, and whatnot, this is uh, 
Th these two are firefighting tools. Most people know about Pulaski, Mr. Pulaski, that uh, he had a hoe and he, and he had an ax and he just welded the two together and, and they named a tool after him. So uh, we, there's a great tool. You've got an ax on one end and you've got this sharp hoe on the other end. So you, it's a really good tool. And this is another, I think it was Mr. McCloyd that uh, came up with this tool, another firefighting tool. Has this aggressive teeth, sharp edge on the other side, and uh, it, you can just really uh, clear a lot of ground with with, with that tool. And just a regular axe and a, a sturdy uh, garden hoe. That this joint seems to be uh, crucial. This is actually all welded back together, but it uh, needs to be a pretty sturdy hoe because when you're uh, raking raking things out, easy to break. So. So land ownership is an uh, important consideration, and, and it's kind of all these nuances, you know. I, 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 you just can't really say too many specifics. Uh, state land is pretty easy to work with generally, because they have this thing that they print out that say generally allowed uses, and one of those is to cut a trail on state land. Anyone can go on and cut a five-foot trail, and don't cut the roots. If you can just brush out a five-foot trail, don't even have to tell them where it is or anything. So. The state's pretty liberal with that. Uh, BLM, you know, a lot of their lands, uh, they're mostly not going to care, but it's, uh, it, I don't, I'm not sure they've got a generally allowed thing there. Uh, then there are easements that uh, have been platted. A lot of our subdivision plats will have a trail easement through them, and uh, so we've got permission to, you know, that gives us permission to go through there. The landowner does ro own to the center of the easement. So you, you are actually on somebody's property, but you have this easement that you are allowed to go on that property and, and that you're, you're allowed to do what's necessary to maintain the trail. So that's the uh, borough attorney on the Scarland Trail. We went round and around, and the borough attorney came out and said, no, you, you've, got, you've got the right to go out and do what you need to do to ma maintain a trail. So, RS-2477, uh, it's an old statute, U.S. statute, that uh, uh, old mail routes, old mining trails, a lot of the old trails could be RS-2477s. And the, and the best thing Wally Hickel did when he was governor, I thought it was going to be, you know, I thought it was going to be a horrible mess, but he went out and, and made a lot of these RS-2477s. He, he adjudicated them, you know, to some extent, and got the legislator to, uh, to say that yes, that is an RS2. You know, they claimed all these different different trails. So Nugget Creek Trail is just a bunch of them all over the place that were well, all from Wally Hickel's making the state agency go out and uh, adjudicate these RS2477 trails. And part of RS2477 are section lines that uh, that the one mile squares that are all our surveyor lines that those can be easements. And they might be 66 feet wide, they might be 100 feet wide, or there may be no easement at all. So it just depends on when it was surveyed, when the land was, was, uh, was, was taken. So that was like it, the issue up on top of Escher Dome is when did it get surveyed and when did the land get staked for the, the 80 acre uh, for the Alaska Street Corporation. So it, uh, it's complicated. You know, you really you need a, a registered land surveyor and DNR to be on your side to determine whether you can actually use a section line as a trail. So it's, it's tricky. Utility easements have no trail, no official trails on them. You know, we use, I'm sure we all use uh, utility easement trails, and, uh, but there is no official walking trail. There's, there might be some places where there's a walking trail on top of a section line or a utility easement, but for the most part, utility easements don't have a uh, public walking easement down them. Uh, North Campus, that they've got a committee, and it's, it's difficult to get permission to do any, anything, and, it's, and it all comes down to, to uh, liability is, that is really what drives uh, you know, all these different land manners, managers. They're, they're going to be sitting there talking to their insurance agent or their liability person or whatever, and, and so to get permission to actually use a dangerous tool on somebody's land, it's not going to happen, or unlikely to happen. I guess some of the, the, uh, the, the recently they brushed some trails out there in the White Mountains, and they actually got permission to use chainsaws. And I was amazed, you know, because usually the land managers 
see a chainsaw and they, they're not going to officially give you permission to, to do that. They're going to want someone certified and trained and, and employed by them to do the work because then workman's, workman's comp protects them. But if it's not one of their workers, they're just, they're just wide open. So it's, it's tough to get permission. So it's, it's, it's the nuances are get pretty. So if you're thinking about doing something on the trail, you might give me a call and we'll talk about it. Or Jeff Orth, John Underwood, uh, Eric Troyer, they're all really plugged in and they kind of know the nuances of all these land managers and, and uh, what, you can, what you can do without getting arrested or shot or <laughs> whatnot. So. UA investment lands, it's different from North Campus. There's the education lands and investment lands. We're a land grant university, and so we have all these lands we got that are just acres and acres of lands that are owned for investment purposes. And, and um, so it's a different group of people that oversees them. And whether you could get permission or not, I don't know. But whether they care or not, probably not too much. It depends on where it is, but it's. Uh, and there's this private land that uh, publicly owned individuals own it. So the rules is don't get hurt. Liability, that's what you're talking about. Is, that, is uh, and you, and you probably can't get permission to do dangerous things. We've had even people talk about loppers and say, oh, well, a Boy Scout could put their finger in there and lop off a finger. And say, oh, this is, uh, it's, it's tough. <laughs> and when you're brushing, look where the snow is going to bring stuff down. So you, the, uh, the snow load comes in, the trees come down, so always when you're out brushing, look, look up, see if there's an alder there. If it's going to be in the trail, get rid of it. Wear your protective equipment, gloves, long pants, sleeves, boots, brush, and the brushing hard hat that I uh, highly recommend, at least tearing protection. And uh, understanding the nuances of uh, land ownership is important. And if a land order greets you, be very, very nice. Don't go into some, we, we had uh, Jack Townsend, I can talk about him now, he's, he's gone. But uh, he was out putting signs up on the Equinox and out in, in uh, Ann's airfield, he was gonna put a sign in the middle of the airfield. And he got belligerent with her, with the owner, uh, Ann Donnelly, who's also passed away. And uh, we got kicked off the airfield for like 10 years. <laughs> it's like. Jack. So, so now we have a portable sign that it's an eight, eight mile sign that we put out every year and then we take it down. It's no problem. We didn't need to put a post in the middle of the airfield. So, so be nice. You don't know who the landowner is and they own the land. So, uh, it's so back to the uh, resources if anybody wants to copy those down. Any questions? Thank you. This is wonderful. You showed several pictures. What's common and typical for the width of a trail, in particular, disturbing you know, the ground, sod, you know, it's not five feet. You, you mentioned five, but I think that's kind of clear. I was wondering on those kind of bases. Well, it, 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 it starts out that if, if you want an easement, you want it at least 20 feet, you know, because you never know whether you're going to have to move back and forth, you know. And if you're, you're brushing, uh, it's nice to have six feet, you know, but tree, tree to tree, from tree to tree, it's, it's nice to have six feet. I used to be six feet, I'm a little shorter now, but it's about six feet is, is what you, you need. The actual tread width, uh, it either, you know, like three feet works pretty well. It kind of depends what, what it's used for, you know. If it's uh, grooming two lanes, then you, you really need more like eight feet tree to tree to groom two lanes, and it kind of depends on usage. But. Sorry, quick question on uh, the Strava heat map. Mom, how extensive is that? How far out of town does that go? It is worldwide. Really? You can go look at Japan, and, it, and it, it is incredible. It's like worldwide. And the, 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 uh, the athletes use it, and it's like Facebook to them, where they, you, can, you can have a, a route where you've drawn it, and then you can compete with all your friends over that same exact route, you know, and so they, they uh, there's, there's a lot more to it than just the heat map, but it, it's uh, very popular with athletes. I've never heard of the Strava map before. Will you please explain it a little better? Well, I was trying to look it up, so, and, and so I was trying to figure out <clears throat> whose phone is making those little lines, because if you look very closely that there's little purple lines, 
that's one phone or one watch, because now they have these GPS watches, ma made that line. And then, then with, with 10 lines, it becomes darker purple. With 100 lines or something, it becomes yellow, brighter color the more people go. And I was trying to, trying to figure out, but, but what it kind of said was, was it was publicly available data. So I think somehow they, they gather all that data that are these little trails that we leave behind us with our phones or our watches. Because I don't think it's just athletes, because the lines are just too bright. There's too many trails to just be the jocks. It's got to be more than just the jocks that are making those lines. So I, I, I think it's just that public available. Every time I move with my cell phone in my pocket, it's it's, yep, it's leaving a little trail behind you. So, <laughs> scary. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> Stan, I also had a question on um, people's opinion about trails. Uh, you've been involved quite a while. You're a, a bit enthusiastic and have been so for a number of decades. But what do you think has been happening recently and are we headed for, you know, some positive times for trails. Obviously, there's some enthusiasts here tonight, but I was wondering what you thought, how things have been going. Well, I think, I think it's pre <clears throat> pretty positive. Yeah, I think the, uh, and the governor vetoed the long trail, but it's like, it's, it's, it's going to take a long time to get the long trail through. So it was, I don't think Tony Knowles had any thought that it'd be done this year, but he was hoping <laughs> that the governor vetoed it. So it's, bit by bit, I think it will eventually happen. You know, I think it was, a good idea, and just like the Appalachia Trail, we'll have the long trail. So I, it's, it, it just takes continued effort to, to make it happen. We've got a great group at the uh, TAC the, that uh, are good there, and we've got a great trails coordinator, Bryant Wright, with the borough, and uh, keep, keep, as long as you keep him funded, every year that's a struggle to keep him funded, but I think he's actually gotten a, someone helping him some now, because. He's got more than he can, he can really do. I mean, it's, it's more than one person job to deal with trails in the borough. It's just, uh, it's just a lot of work, so I'm, I'm hopeful. And related to that, the borough trails challenge, could you just comment on the impact that's having on the local trails and associations and stuff? Yes, that's, it's just been amazing to me that, you know, I just go on trails all the time anyway, and I love seeing the birds or whatever. But the trails challenge ticked, picked, it, 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 it stirred something in people, you know? I mean, we love an Easter egg hunt, you know? And so to put these signs out there and then have people go around to each sign and take their selfie with it and put it on the Facebook page and enter this contest, the, the trails that end up on that get like 10 times the use that a trail without a sign on it does. I mean, it's just, I, I, I'm just befuddled by it. It's just, I had no idea that it would be that popular, but it, it's, um, it's like every summer and every winter, the borough puts up 10 or I think 20 signs even sometimes, and then posts the map that tells you where to get those signs. Some are easy, you know, they're right in town. You can take your kids and take a stroller up to them. And I guess there's one out the Kampu Trail, which is like 13 miles out to the sign or something. It's like, that's going to, that's going to, uh, that's going to be tough for some people to get to that one, but. It's been, a, it does really increase the use. So Brian is very careful about picking trails that have a full easement, that are public, and are, that they're not gonna be trespassing, and that hopefully you're not gonna piss anybody off. So he's, he selects pretty carefully to uh, evaluate each one to make sure that it's not gonna piss off some landowner too bad. <laughs> All right, well, I think we've answered everybody's questions, and the ones they're not sure of, they're going to go back to uaf.edu backslash summer backslash events. And in a couple of weeks, we will have it all edited, and it will be there for years to come. So you've got a great resource here. So let's give Stan a wonderful, I feel like we should walk around, but maybe let's just give you a little more.